All right, I'd like to take a look at uh, Leviticus and, and just give you a few notes for the opening of Leviticus. You know that what we're talking about is that there are seven different kinds of literature in the Bible. The most frequent type of literature that you see in 54% of the Bible, if my unscientific uh, cutting apart of Bibles is of any quality, and when I say cutting apart of Bibles, I mean cutting apart of Bibles, 54% uh, of the Bible's narrative appears to be biography. It is a historical narrative, or what you would just simply say if you're watching TNT, you'd call it drama. And uh, that's the biggest chunk. Behind that, though, there are a number of other chunks. The smallest one is probably lamentation. And that's the one where we go from the, um, the deep emotional angst of a man to where he meets God. God, you're not fair. You're letting people get away with stuff. Habakkuk 1. To, oh God, in wrath remember mercy. Where we start by looking at the problem and end up by looking at the, at the providential one who solves the problem. And we, we start by looking at our emotions and expressing them, and we end up grabbing hold of the garment of God. Then the third one we have, of course, is, uh, well, that, that would be the third. Fourth one we have it would be prophecy, and there's quite a bit of prophecy in the book, and we're going to talk about that prophetic narrative, and some of it we'll even bump into in Leviticus 26 today, because there's a tiny little prophetic portion that gets dropped into the middle of legal code. There's also poetry, and we've got substantial amounts of that because you have a lot of songs and lyrics from the biblical world, uh, like the, the, um, um, the Psalms themselves, Tehillim, the pouring out of myself before God. And then, of course, we have wisdom literature, which is going to be proverbial literature, or how life should work. And then here, we're in the midst of our seventh one, which is legal code. And legal code is actually quite substantial in the Bible. Now, here's the bottom line. You don't understand how God thinks if you don't understand the law. God is a judicial thinker. And so you have the three types of law. We looked at civil code or part of it in Exodus. We will look at part of it in Numbers. 10 chapters of civil code, how to get along on a camping trip in the wilderness. And then you have 38 years, five months and 20 days later, the foundation of the constitutional law in Deuteronomy. And then stuck back at Sinai was the criminal code of law, which was your heart's broke, you'll need a goat, I'll tell you what to do with it. And in the midst of that, Leviticus drops into that code of law. Now remember that we started with, what's the Hebrew name for Genesis? Bereshit, Rosh is head in the beginning. And then we started the move to Exodus, which starts off with what? These are the names, Shemot, names. And when you get to Leviticus, the opening is, and he called, Vayikra. And Vayikra law is the criminal code of law. It's just the and he called law. It's the beginning of the scroll, because when you open up the scroll, the first words are the title in Hebrew. It gets the name Leviticus because of the Latin Vulgate version of the, the um, um, translation. When Jerome translated the Greek Bible, the Greek Septuagint version from just before the time of Jesus, after the time of Jesus, Jerome translated it into Latin, and he took the Greek and threw it on the Latin, and that became part of the Catholic Church, and so it stays with us in the name Leviticus today. It just means pertaining to the Levites. It might be worth you noting on the front end of Leviticus that the New Testament writers quote Leviticus at least 15 clear times and make allusion to it other times beyond that. The, the notion that, well, that's Old Testament and we don't have to deal with it is not a New Testament notion because the New Testament writer makes his arguments on the basis of Levitical law. You, you undo the New Testament when you undo Leviticus. Now, I'm not saying you have to kill a goat to make God happy because that was a law given to a specific group of people at a specific time. I'm saying it's not as clean as, well, that's the law. We, the law is done away. Wait a minute. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Then the whole basis of Hebrews is deconstructed. The entire basis of the argumentation of 1 Corinthians is deconstructed when you take away the law. He makes his points of right and wrong based on the law. So the law still defines what God cares about, how he thinks about things. 
We are becoming soft-minded in the church and being told that God used to care about certain parameters of sexuality, but nowadays we're not under the law, which somehow makes it like God used to think something was wrong and doesn't think it's wrong anymore. That's a mishandling of the Bible. So when you get into the, the uh, Leviticus, let's, let's stop and uh, ask the question, who's the author? Moses, um, about when? Well, since the Exodus is around 445 BC, this will place him somewhere in the first year out of the Exodus because he's at Sinai a year later. And I'm, I'm thinking specifically, you might want to make a note of like uh, Leviticus 2734. And if you cross-reference 2734 with 738, you come up with the fact that th this chronicles a time when God gave the law to Moses, specifically at the mountain, which was a year out. Uh, he spent time at Mount Sinai, uh, less than a year out of the, um, the, the journey. Remember, 50 days after Passover, they're at the mountain of the law. And then they remain there for a period of time as God unspools that law. So it's the year of the Exodus that the law in Sinai is given. It's interesting because um, Numbers begins after this. It, it, if you actually line it up, Leviticus picks up the record in the first month of the, uh, the new year, and then Numbers 1-1 picks up the second month. So you see that there's actually an, a, a legitimate order to it. Okay, I'm, I'm not sure that that's, um, that's as exciting to you. Let, let me throw something else in here. Leviticus, in the form that you have it, is not the form it was originally written in. How do I know that? because there are some inserted case studies that are dropped into the narrative. Like in 8, 9, and 10, you have a strange fire incident. You all remember that, a vihu and the strange fire. Well, it's, it's told in a chronological story, but obviously inserted into the narrative at, alongside of, by the way, this is how I want this to work, and it's told because it's a record of something that happened at the time of the consecration of the priests in uh, chapters 8 and 9. A little bit of background. You get four things from Leviticus that the Israelites didn't have going into the time when they met God at the mountain. The first one is they didn't have a marker of his presence. I, I mean, he temporarily gave them the um, highway through the water, you know, or the, uh, wa you know, the water springs uh, in the desert. But the truth is there was no permanent marker of God's presence. So when they created the tabernacle, it was quite literally like God dropped himself right in the middle of the camp and said, this is where I will meet with you. So it's kind of like, a, have you ever been to an airport that has a meeting point? The tabernacle became the meeting point with God and they didn't really have one. The, the second thing was they had a, a specific place and pattern of worship. Up until that time, how did an Israelite worship? Well, before the 10 generations of being uh, in Egypt as, and being slaves, we have some vague notions in Genesis. You all remember these vague notions of how does, how does Noah know what's a clean and unclean animal? We don't know. We just know God communicated it to him and that that's not made clear until Leviticus 11, but he already knew. We have these occasional people that drop by, the Melchizedek, the Jethro, who are the leftovers of when people believed getting off the ark. Remember, when, 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 when the ark rested and Noah and Shem, Ham, and Yephet got off, everybody believed God was serious about sin. Nobody was going, gee, I wonder if there's really a God. No atheist got off the ark. And, and as they spread out across the earth, some people still believed. And, and so you end up with a Jethro over here in Midianite territory or a Melchizedek stuck right in the middle of Eretz Israel or the land of Israel and they're believers and we don't have any record as to how to trace them back to Noah or how they kept their belief or what their Sabbath school looked like. We don't even know if they knew what a Sabbath really was because the record doesn't come until Moses. We, we don't know what they actually believe. We don't know how they con conceptualized it, but, but they keep appearing. So we have a presence marker for God. We have a, a place and a pattern for worship. And one of the exciting things for me in looking at the tabernacle with you was I love to go back every year at the beginning and look at the law and be challenged again that my worship got flat. Does yours get flat? my worship gets flat. It does. And then at this point in the year, every year, God brings me back to those passages that go, wait a minute, I set a pattern for worship. The third thing that we got out of this that we didn't have going into it, Israel didn't have it, we didn't have it, nobody had it, was a specification of the priesthood. 
We, we have an actual family of priests coming out of this. Going for, away from Sinai, they had a priestly family. Going into it, all they had was a mess. Interestingly enough, what God chose for a priestly family was the guy who caused the mess, which I think is pretty funny. The guy who was down there um, overseeing the golden calf experience becomes the high priest. And once again, you see that if this isn't a God story, there's no man that would make up a story this way. Actually, we're a bunch of ex-cons led by a guy who's a former murderer and a high priest who uh, was an idolater. Other than that, we're really good people, right? So, so that's the story. Now, the, the fourth one is we also, and this is really important for Leviticus, we also end up with beyond a priesthood and the pattern of the priesthood, we end up with this, um, this penalty place. We end up with a specific remedy for our sin. There's a concept, and it's the biggest single concept in Leviticus, and very few Christians ever talk about it. It's called the blood for blood concept. By now, having read it, discussed it, and listened to me bloviate on it, you should know blood for blood is what? Okay, the, uh, originally blood for blood is the, the price tag for taking life is life. Blood for blood. And you cannot resolve the taking of life without life. There has to be blood for blood. That's the single greatest concept in the book. And you mentioned the word atonement because you're correct that in that system, atonement worked until the blood was equal to the sin. And in Jesus, we now have blood that does not atone for our sins. It washes it away because it's equal to the sin. The blood of bulls and goats was not equal to the sin. It was temporarily equal to abate the wrath of God, but it didn't permanently deal with the sin. It put off judgment. That's what it did. Now, one of the things that I love about this book is that it gives me a pattern. It gives me a pattern of a newly redeemed people. Exodus 19, verse 6, makes the point that, that God says to Israel, you're a kingdom of priests, you're a holy nation. Now, this newly redeemed people have to learn how to worship and obey him. They don't have any other choice. By the way, 1 Peter 2.9 says the same thing to believers today. That, that coming out of darkness, coming out of 400 years of servitude of the world's thinking, they needed it to reset their thinking. What am I saying? I'm making a commentary on Romans 12.1 and 2. I'm saying that when you... Revelation is critical to people who have been walking in darkness. God's going to reveal himself at Sinai. Why? Because for 10 generations, they absolutely were pressed into the mold of an Egyptian way of thinking. And the Egyptian way of thinking was pagan, polytheistic, emotional based. And the bottom line is God wanted to not let them be conformed to the image of the world, but be transformed, metamorphized by the renewing of their mind so that they could know what is acceptable to God. And so what you have then is, let me say it another way, worship and morality were badly distorted by their time in Egypt. How many of you agree with that? You, you can't go to Egypt and not see gods. You can't go to Egypt and not see polytheism and paganism in every monument built by the pharaohs or built more properly by the slaves for the pharaohs. These guys spent 10 generations and the last part of those generations, maybe not the whole time, but the last part of those generations, they were specifically molding gods of the world. So God got them out to, to Sinai and said, you gotta stop, that's not who I am. And how did he tell them who he was? He didn't sit down and give them a long poetry. He didn't give them a Homeric epic of, of a guy on a great struggle. What he did was he gave them laws. And to be honest with you, one of the fundamental problems that our world has with our God is they don't want the rules. So we have Christians that have accommodated their thinking as it regards God's standards and tried to say, well, look, God is so much more mushy in the New Testament that now his standards are somehow not clear. That's not only abhorrent, it's downright dangerous. 
When I take away the sharp knife from my two-year-old, I do so to preserve their life. They don't like me very much at that point. To which I say, too bad. Because adults step up and understand what children need. Now, if that's true in the relationship you see, can you imagine the difference between me and God and what he sees and what I need? What if God warned us off some behaviors because they, we, we would do very well in those behaviors for a time and then we would crash? What if God warned off his people from basing their entire economic system on interest? And then we grew up in America where the whole system is based on interest until we crash the system. What if, see, I'm okay talking in generalizations, but when you get down to that in the church, people start getting ruffled. The reason they get ruffled is because they're more American than Christian. They understand are, they are American life. American life is spend two thirds of your life building up as much wealth as you can so you can spend it in the last third of your life. That's Americanism, that's what it is. It's all about the, the epitome of American life is I own my house, I own my car, and I play golf when I want. As if there's something biblical about that. And I'm not speaking downward because I'm part of the culture. I'm simply testing the cultural analysis against what the text says. Is that what God said life should be? Some of us have gotten used to the idea of the disintegrated family. We actually literally believe now, I'm 18, I can go pick my own spouse and move out and go do what I want. As if that has anything to do with the patriarchal structure of the family. It doesn't. It doesn't. You want the blessing of God and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren? There's a way to pull it off. But the same God who says, I am tender toward those who follow me, says, I visit the iniquities of the children on, uh, by their parents onto the third and fourth generation. Now, there's going to be somebody out there arguing, well, Jesus took that away. I'd like to see the scripture that validates that he took it away. Because I'm going to tell you, my counseling is filled with people who drink because their parents did, who beat their children because they were beaten as children. I see this thing snowballing, and I see Christians sticking their head in their sand and acting like, well, Jesus did away with all that. I don't understand how that works. I think if we screw up the next generation, we're going to have to live with a screwed up generation. Does anybody uh, have a problem with that? If we tolerate wrong, wrong will flourish. And when wrong flourishes, inequity will be the result. So when I look at this, what I see is that the presence of God's glory among them, the, the central place of worship, was all brought out in Revelation. So what we're going to be looking at is we're going to be looking at some of the ways God made himself known as we unpeel Leviticus. If there is a message for the book, for the believer, without spiritualizing, if there's a message to this book, it's as simple as this. Holiness is distinctiveness from the world's pattern based on a biblical worldview. That's the definition of holiness. Holiness is distinctiveness against the world's pattern based on a biblical worldview. So when I, I understand what God's word says and I live according to its principles, and I live without trying to somehow tolerate myself into peace with the world at enmity with God, then I'm distinct. When I look at the person who I'm dating and say, no, we're not going to do that because I am holy to the Lord. I don't mean I'm holy. I mean, I belong to Jesus and you belong to Jesus and we can't do that. Why? Because he said so. And he knows how it's supposed to work. Holiness to the Lord is distinctiveness from the world system, played out from a biblical worldview. And it doesn't have to be mean. And it doesn't have to all be like we're sucking green persimmons and walking around telling everybody why they're wrong. It's about Anna living life with a smile. But walking with God and deciding that, deciding that your life belongs to Jesus. And because it belongs to Jesus, you're going to take what he said and actually, did you ever have one of those Play-Doh things where you stick the Play-Doh in, you push it down, and it goes out? 
Okay, I want you to put yourself, I want this, this thing to be God's word, and I want you to be this Play-Doh. Put yourself in it, and let it press you into the standard shape of what God's word wants, not the mold of the world. They already have a mold they want you to have. How's it working for them? Because Solomon in Ecclesiastes makes it pretty clear that when he chased things under the sun, it was a crappy life. And, and when you chase things under the sun, they don't make sense. In fact, it's all a bubble. It's all vain. Because he kept saying, I was under the sun. He didn't get it till he went above the clouds, till he went all the way out in the stratosphere, all the way out beyond the heliosphere, all the way out to where God is. And then he said, you know what? Now it's different out here. You want to you wanna base your life in, look, there's two things that are competing, particularly in your generation. You need to understand them. Number one, you're the first generation being raised not by parents, but by crowd speak. Crowd speak is social media. That is, there is right now pouring into your life, not news sources. When I grew up, you're not going to believe this, but we had four channels on television. We also had something that in the ancient days was called black and white TV. But ba back in the day, you got it from ABC, CBS, or NBC, or public television, or you didn't get it. Now, you're getting news from the blogosphere of people who have lots to say who may know nothing about what they're saying, but you don't know that because they put words together well. And they pick it up. You could write a fake article. Try me. You could go out and write a fake article that sounds plausible about some secret thing President Obama did to steal your freedom, your guns, or rape your daughters. And people will broadcast it across the net like it's true. The Blaze or Onion puts out something that's sarcasm, and half the people on the net are enraged because they don't understand it's sarcastic. It's not true. They don't even get it. What I'm saying is you're growing up with the weakest position for parents in our society because legislatively we have made parents weak. We've made, we've made legislators and educators stronger than parents, but we've made children stronger than educators. So we've empowered children and now have crowd speak. And why is that important? Because you can't Tolerate Egyptian ideas of morality and sin and not be pressed into the mold of the world. The second one that you need to understand is that in Christianity, we are now a publisher-ran organization. We're now run from the top down where somebody writes the 30 days of whatever and everybody preaches it. Somebody writes the Hillsong song and everybody sings it. We are published out of personal response. And I'm not saying that all the books are bad, and I'm not saying that all the songs, man, I like some of the songs, I told you that. The point is that the, in the broad crowd speak of Christianity, the individual believer being molded by God to stand out distinctively from the world is being fashioned by a publishing house. We gotta be careful. So we go back to Leviticus, and what do we see? We see a lot of law in the book, but it's given in the context of some events. So it begins after Moses supervised the construction of the tabernacle and God comes in glory to dwell there. And at the end of Exodus, Exodus 40, you remember this? God showed up and we did two different uh, class sessions on God showed up and, and Psalm 15 and preparing my heart to see him. And then right in the middle of that, it's like God occupies the tabernacle like his palace as a place of meeting, and then you come and see the king, and Moses, on behalf of the people, goes and sees the king until he hands it off to Aaron, who goes and sees and represents the king. And the whole time, they're staying at the foot of Sinai. One note you want to make at the beginning of Leviticus. There's no geographical movement in the book. They're parked at below Sinai the whole time. They're in the shadow of Sinai for the entire book. And in fact, you can see that when God comes down to give his law, you'll see it in, uh, in uh, 25 1, you'll see it in 26 46. And they're still there one month later when the record of Numbers begins in Numbers 1 1. So Leviticus precedes the beginning of Numbers and it antecedes uh, Exod Exodus 1 through 19 and the arrival at the mountain of the law. All right, there are three theological themes. One of them is the holiness of God. It is mentioned only 152 times in the book of Leviticus. 
152 times. If you walk away from this book and go, I wonder if it's about holiness. Hello, 152 times in 27 chapters. I mean, really, what does, what does God have to do to get you to go, oh, I think that's my theme right there. Holy, 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 holy. Sounds like a, a Bach concerto. Um, Handel's Messiah, you know, something. Okay, um, second, and, and this is, I'm going to say this differently than a lot of Christians say it. Again, this comes from Jewish education. Um, Christians will always point out with, that it's, secondly, the way to deal with sin. That's true, but it's incomplete. It's the way to deal with sin and celebration. There's an awful lot of what went on in the tabernacle and then what went on in the temple after that wasn't about sin. Every Christian asked the question, in the millennial period, how come there's, if Jesus has already died, why are there still sacrifices? Because most sacrifices don't have to do with sin. We, Christians are obsessed with a sin-based everything. You know why? Because we have so much guilt and so little celebration in Christianity that it's all about the wrong thing. We truncated through a thousand years of Roman theology and in, and in the Roman church we came out of it with enormous guilt. They walked into every service and looked at a Jesus being crucified on the cross and, and went over the death. You know that the mass isn't about the resurrection, it's about the death, it's about the atonement, it's about the, the sin problem and that's all they learned. So Christians became better at focusing on sin and guilt than focusing on celebration. But Leviticus is about both. And so, quite frankly, there's a lot of it that has to do with blessing. So I have a shalmim because I, I come in and offer a shalmim because God gave me a son. It's not sin, it's I'm happy. So as we walk through, and I'm going to carefully pick through those chapters because we flew through them last time. Uh, I, as we walk through it, I want you to see that there's something very real going on there. Okay, let me go on and say a third one. So the holiness of God is one. The second one is the way to deal with both sin and blessing. And the third one is in the context of celebration, it's the worship of God's people. The requirements for worship, the methods of worship, and the results of worship. So the Psalm 15-ish requirements. What does it require of me to deal with in my life so that I can go into the holy hill and I can relax before God. What is required of my life before I get into worship? Or what I, what I like to refer to as the Saturday checklist. Is my Saturday right? Because your Sunday will be ineffective for worship if your Saturday doesn't happen properly. So take your seven things that we saw in the 11 characteristics of Psalm 15, apply them to the Saturdays of your life, because that's what this pastor does. When I'm all finished and I've reviewed everything, I set it aside and I go through the dashboard of my life and go, okay, how am I doing? What's my tongue doing? And, and what I find is if my Saturday stinks, my Sunday stinks. Oh, I don't mean the performance of it. Ah, you, can, you, can, you can absolutely offer a brilliant sermon that the crowd loves and Jesus weeps. You, you can do that while you're living in sin. I've known many a man who did. The point is that if I'm going to really worship myself, then Saturday has to be worked out. Then when I'm there, what is worship? How do I decide whether or not I just had a service or whether I actually worshiped? Because there's a difference. And then what should be the natural results? That's one of the big keys of what Leviticus gives us. All right, so what we have in the book is three boxes. And the last one's the bigger one. One to seven will give us offerings. And the offerings are to design or to lay out for you the basic atonement issues and to deal with the remedy for sin under criminal law. That's what they are. The, the second one is eight through 10, and that's to deal with priests and priesthood. And because you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation, according to 1 Peter chapter 2, it's important to know what priests are like, how they got in, how they act, what they have promised. And although your priesthood isn't of the same uh, big hat and ephod wearing type, tell me you don't need holiness to the Lord written on your head. Because I'm thinking believers need it. I'm thinking that they had a graphic picture of something that we need a spiritual picture of and we need to renew it in our lives. And then, of course, when you get to 11 to 27, you get your third block. 
And this will be the applications of the various types of law. The applications of law, and I want to look at the, what they are specifically, but let's just um, make note that the problem with studying Leviticus is this whole section and this whole section only tells you what. It only says, kill a goat, do it on the north side of the altar. It doesn't explain why or when. <laughs> it just says, do it. And so what you have is a lot more what, and I don't mean there's none, but for the most part, what is the answer there. And then this is the when and why section. This is when you do it. In fact, in order to know when a grain offering should be made, you can't even just study Leviticus. You have to study the rest of the Torah and, ease, and look for the word min, mincha. If you don't know where the grain offering shows up or the apportionment offering of the mincha, you're, you're, you have to look all the way through the law. So I, I'm going to short it out and save you the time by doing it as we go through the study, okay? So that we don't have to read the whole law and come back and put it in. I've done that and I'm going to dump it back in for you. The point is that if you have the second half of Leviticus, you know why you're doing some of the things the first half tells you how to do. The first half, though, is telling you what you're doing and how you're doing it. And I guess I only, I only put the what. I should have put my, to make it what and how as opposed to what, oh, when and why, okay? Is everybody okay with that? You, you sort of got the, the general ropes of that? Here's what I want you to do. You've got offerings, and do you remember very quickly what they are? What's the first offering? Olay. Okay, good. You're going to give me the Hebrew for it. Olay is the burnt offering, all for God, none for us, nothing but smoke going up and ash coming out, right? What's the second one? Mincha. Mincha. If anybody does mincha, I'm going to come after you, okay? Mincha. Can I hear you say it, please? Mincha. Mincha. Give me a little chet. Mincha. Mincha. Okay. Mincha is apportionment, and it means whether it's the time of the year that you have the seed or the time of the year that you have the stalk or the time of the year that you have the head of the grain or the time of the year that you can make it into a cake, I want what you have when you are. Promise me now, not later. Third offering. Shalmin. The shalmin. Shalmin, like shalom, the balancing of what is right when all things are as they should be. The shalmin is... I just got something from God and now I want to give back a portion of what he's given to me so that I can remind myself that everything I still have is also his. And hallelujah. Shell means the only one everybody gets to eat, including the guy who's offering it. It is the biggest picnic one. This is the one with party hats and okay. All right, what's the next two? They go together, sort of. Good. Chata. Ah, the chata. Ah is the word for sin or misses the mark and it has to do with both intentional and unintentional it has to do with omission and commission but then there's also the alsham the alsham sin is what it's a trespass and it's a specific subset of chata'a which is you messed with something God made distinctive. He considers holiness, and the word for holy in the Bible is distinct. Kadosh is distinct. You took something God made for a distinctive purpose, and you used it in a, in a way that was not its distinct purpose. My son used to believe that, that you only needed a hammer to fix everything. When you use a hammer on things that need a screwdriver, you mess them up permanently. Okay, so this is the basics. Now, after that, in the line between that and the priests, you end up with the miluim. And what's the miluim? Where does it go? Blood on the... Yeah, there you go. Blood on the right ear, blood on the right thumb, blood on the right toe. It is a consecration offering, and it says, be careful little ears what you hear. All that my hands do, every place that my feet go, these belong to God. I'm a priest. I am not my own. I'm bought with a price. Therefore, I am to glorify God in my body, which is his. Okay? And so there's a restatement of the Middleween principle later on. All right. When you get down to the applications of the law, in 11, this is a part you don't have yet. We did not do this. You have the food laws. 
What does God consider food for a Jew? Now, I'm going to be very specific because in Genesis 9, he said, For the world, of all these things you shall eat. Then as a subset of the world, the sons of Ham, uh, sons of uh, Shem through Terah, through Abraham, through Isaac, through Jacob, he said, you have a specific group of food laws. You are marked by these food laws. So I am not asking you to go out and start keeping kosher. I am telling you that you're not Jewish. And you're under the of all these things you shall eat, so try them all. Because that's what I'm trying to do. Get through the entire list of food before you die, okay? So I eat ham with impunity. I don't worry about having ham. I don't, you know, I, okay, I do feel a little bit weird about having ham, but that's because I lived kosher and lived in Israel for a long time. But beside from that, um, aside from that little twinge of just feeling a little awkward about it, we call it the other white meat. These are health issues. You gotta remember that the Israelites didn't know about bacteria. And the only thing they knew about people when they die is that you get some canopic jars, you open up their body, you take their brain out through their nose, you stick it in a jar. That's what Egyptians did. They knew mummification. They knew, I mean, 10 generations, they've been working on stuff that was totally foreign to Abraham, totally foreign to Isaac or Jacob. These are not, you know, not foreign to Jacob, but, but, but for a whole different reason. The, the point is that this wasn't an Israelite thing. It was that they lived in a culture that was not theirs. Okay, so in 12, we have what are called postpartum issues. Um, if... You go through the experience, the incredible, incredible, joyful, wonderful, painful and messy experience of having a baby. The postpartum issues are issues of blood. The thing God cares about deeply is blood. There is a reason the enemy goes after every holiday that has to do with remembering God. There's a reason why Christmas is now Santa Claus Day and Easter is now Easter Bunny Day. There is a reason, because he's trashing the celebrations. But there's another, there's a reason why people drop a rock on their foot and don't say, oh, Buddha, they say Jesus, because he's demeaning a name. And there's a reason that our culture is obsessed with vampires and undead because they're trashing blood. And the story is about blood. And there's a reason why our culture cannot stand the picture of monogamous marriage because it's a picture of God and Israel and Christ and his church. And they, everything that could communicate to a person in the world who God is and what he's like gets trashed in a pagan culture. Everything. They're going after, this isn't just a culture war. It's a cosmic war against the reality of the Bible. It's a cosmic war against who God is and how he saves people. So we have a postpartum set of laws that deal with blood. And then we have skin and surface issues. And that's going to be in, thir in 13 to 15. That's a three in Randy. I have my own language when it comes to writing. Um, and th these are going to be, here's the problem. When, when you're in the desert and everybody's living in a tent, mold is a really big issue. And your, your not taking care of the mold on your tent will ruin my tent. The problem is they were slaves. And when you make individuals into a community, you then have problems that the individuals wouldn't have had. I don't disagree that we need an educational system in the country. I believe that when we paganized the education system, we gave the wrong people charge over morality. Why? Because we're a community now. And now how they want to deal with mold becomes the way to deal with mold. I simply argue that condoms in the classroom gave us bullies in the classroom. How did I get there? Because when you convince kids they can't do right and will not be held to that standard and then give them mechanisms to do wrong and then give them social media to bully each other, what you have taught them is you cannot be held to the standard of right and wrong because there's something defective in you that will make you have sex and be mean. What I'm trying to say is very pointed, but I'm trying to get you to understand the, the 
Skin and surface issues are issues of communal living. Your rights stop at my nose, Robert. You can have all the rights you want, but when it comes onto my nose, now you're dealing with my rights. And so that what we end up with is a society that's trying to define what the communal issues are with no foundational moral base in what God has said. If I wasn't a Christian, I wouldn't care about abortion. I wouldn't know that I was destroying a generation of people. I wouldn't realize that what I'm saying, I, I might even buy the argument that it's part of her body, except for it's a different sex and different DNA, and scientifically that isn't true. I, I, I would be able to buy into things because I wouldn't have a moral base to stand on. When we created a communal standard, we trashed the biblical one. Now, when you get down to 16 to 18, you come into some restrictions. And guys, I know, this is kind of heavy, but I, I love this because you're never going to get a better understanding of how God thinks than when you don't understand. When you grab hold of the law, you'll walk out and go, I get it. I get what he's like. Not that he's some, you know, big, bearded, angry, throned, you know, guy from an album cover, okay? It's, it's that he's actually, he's actually making it it's not wrong for the coach to explain to you the rules before you play the game. That's not mean. That's trying to keep you from getting an elbow in your teeth. You can't go out there and in the middle of the game decide, you know what, I think I'll do it with my feet. It's basketball. You can't do that. And, and what happens is when people start making up the rules in the middle and reject the premise of the game, they play badly. And then they hurt each other. So in the restrictions, 16 is famous because it has Yom Kippur in it, and Yom Kippur is the Day of Atonement. We're going to come back and deal with that specifically. 17 deals specifically with blood and issues of blood, and it will come back to postpartum issues as a subset, but blood issues, and it's more carefully spelled out. And then in 18, I guarantee you we will spend time there, rules of sexuality. And it will be the basis, by the way, of the rules all the way up until January 1st of 2013 in the United States. And as of this year, we are now creating a set of rules to deconstruct that Levitical law. So that gender in California is no longer your physical parts, it's what you think you are. That says that's just plain stupid. That says you can take it out and go, it's a boy, and know that it is. God spoke by the parts on your body. Okay? It's not about how you feel about them. It's about the fact that you have them. And you may feel the way you feel because of some other problem. So let's start off addressing what the other problem is. It's absolutely crazy. Crazy. Did you know that... Uh, Abortion is a crime against a woman. That came from Planned Parenthood in 1952. One generation goes, grows up saying it's wrong, the next one says it's right like they never said it. And you go from being bad to good. And then, here's the problem, when wrong becomes right, right becomes wrong. And now, in 2013, as wrong becomes right, your point of view, that point of view will be seen as wrong. You will be intolerant and taking away civil rights of other people because they have a right to do wrong based on biblical reality. Okay, now, when you see it then in 20, there, there's an interesting set of things that happen after this. Um, and I can't do this without erasing. I'm almost done because I know Ben's panicking by now. The, the, uh, let me do it this way. 19 and, let me do a box, a big box, then another small box, okay? 19 and 20, in 19 and 20, he's dealing with the violations and impurities. He deals with things that go wrong, violations and impurities. 
And he's doing that on the way to a very, very large section here that begins in 21 and moves all the way to uh, 25 that is all about priestly operations, priestly ops. With one exception, there's a drop down. In 24, there's a very specific chapter that we're going to talk about, which is special violations of criminal proceedings. These are cases of criminals. These are their stories, junk, junk. OK? Right there. All right. Then past priestly ops, what we have is punishment and redemption. And this will pick up in 26, 27, and the, one of the most important chapters in all of the book is chapter 26, and we will spend special time there. Because 26 will offer two things, the conditions of the covenant and a pattern of seven. Let me suggest to you that this is partly prophetic. The seven years tribulation are first sketched out by God in 26 of Leviticus. And he says repeatedly, I will give you seven times what you give me. You violate this and I'll give you seven, 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 seven. And he's going to pick that later up. And the proposition of the writer of scripture is there's a special time when God is going to deal with his estranged wife and get her to finally bend her neck and say, uncle, and then he will take her back. The restoration of Israel comes in that same thing. The end of 26 is restoration. It's terrible tribulation followed by restoration. 26, 1 to 13 is all what happens if you obey. Or shall I say, during those brief moments of obedience, here's what I will do to bless you because of it. How many of you have felt God's blessing and would admit that it's during those brief times of obedience between the long stretches of disobedience or disinterest? Okay? All right. So, you, so 1 to 13, we can already smile about. Put a little smiley face next to it. You know what it is. All right. When you get to 14, if you do not obey me and do not carry out my commandments, 16, right next to it, the word sick. I'll make you sick. I will appoint over you a sudden terror, consumption, and a fever, and you will waste away. And <laughs> you're going to get sick. 17, war. I'll set my face against you. You'll be struck down before your enemies. Those who hate you will roll over you. So captivity. And then I want you to circle the word in verse 18, seven times. Verse 21, seven times. Verse 24, seven times. Verse 28, seven times. And that's before you get down to the land rest, which is Sabbath, which is the seventh day down in 34. Okay, do you see that he says, verse 18, if after these initial things you do not obey me, I will punish you seven times more for your sin. So the pattern of something that is a seven times sin is laid out in front of them. And by the way, in verse 21, if you act with hostility against me and are unwilling to obey, I'll increase the plague on you seven times according to your sin. Uh, by the way, in verse 22, I'm going to bring calamity. The beasts of the field are going to come in and eat you. Nature will work against you. And how long? Verse 24, seven times for your sin. In verse 26, I will break your staff of bread. Ten women will bake your bread in one oven and they will bring back your bread in rationed amounts. In other words, starvation. And by the way, I'll take you into captivity if you don't give my land a rest. And in verse 34, the land will enjoy the Sabbaths all the days of desolation. In verse 35, all the days of its desolation, it will observe the rest which it will not observe on your Sabbaths while you were living on it. Do you know why the people went 70 years into captivity? 
because 490 years they didn't observe God's law, and so God gave the land seven years of rest, one for every seven. That's exactly why they were in there for 70 years. Later on, the Bible's going to tell you that, because Ezra knew it. Nehemiah knew it. Daniel knew it. Jeremiah knew it. Ezekiel knew it. They all understood what God was doing. They even understood how long. Daniel gets on his knees and starts praying, you said 70 years. I was reading Jeremiah. You said 70 years. It's 68 years. I don't see anything happening. And an angel shows up to Daniel. This isn't random. This is part of a story that's going to pop up later on in the text. So you want to know the pattern that's here. But I want to say something that is terribly important because two-thirds of the American church doesn't agree with it. Replacement theology is that God used to be working with Israel and now he's working with the church. That isn't true. And they do it based on what they call a conditional covenant of Moses. But wait a minute. The covenant started with Abraham. And Abraham's covenant, was it conditional or unconditional? Unconditional because Abraham was asleep when God made it. It wasn't about him. It was about God. I will do this for you. And he parts these things and walks between them and says, all the things I told you in chapter 12 of Genesis and 15 of Genesis and 17 of Genesis. And then he went on to say again in 23 and 26 of Genesis and in 46 of Genesis, he says, I have been making promises to the people. These promises aren't conditional. In other words, I'm going to bless the world through you and I'm going to give you a piece of real estate. And if it takes 5,000 years, I'm going to do it. And I'm going to, I'm going to, Put your kids out there like the sands of the seashore in number, and there's going to be an incredible, um, obvious blessing to those who bless you and a curse to those who curse you. There's an unconditional set of covenants. But in that covenant, there was also a land contract that I have a spe special piece of grant. Abe, look north, look south, look east, look west. All this is the land contract for your kids for how long? Forever. Now that's not conditional, but what this covenant says, the Mosaic doesn't cancel out the Abrahamic. No later covenant bulldozes an earlier one. So, in other words, after the Abrahamic covenant, we don't go, well, but now we have to worry about rainstorms again. The Noahic covenant isn't erased by the Abrahamic one. The Mosaic covenant is this. It's not conditional about the ownership of the land or the blessing of God. This is where you find it, right here in 38. But you will perish among the nations. Your enemies' land will consume you. So that those of you who may be left will rot away because of their iniquity in the land of your enemies. And also because of the iniquities of their forefathers, they will rot away with them. If here it is, here's the turn, box it, put a box around the little if, if, verse 40, they confess their iniquity, the iniquity of their forefathers, in the unfaithfulness which they have committed against me, and also in their acting with hostility against me, I will also was acting with hostility against them to bring them into the land of their enemies, or if their uncircumcised heart becomes humbled so that they may make amends for their iniquity. Now put a box around, then, if, then, if then, verse 42, I will remember my covenant with Jacob. I will remember also my covenant with Isaac. I will remember my covenant with Abraham as well. I will remember the land. In other words, yes, I'm going to beat the stuffings out of you if you walk away from me. The condition is a domicile condition. This is an ownership title condition. In other words, the land belongs to God, and he says, I give it to the sons of Abraham in perpetuity forever, but you'll only get to live in it if you walk with me. And if you don't, you lose your domicile. You don't lose the potential to have it back. You lose your domicile for a time. But look at how the story ends. It ends with, for the land will be abandoned by them, verse 43 will make up for its Sabbaths while it is made desolate without them. 
They meanwhile will be making amends for their iniquity because they rejected my ordinances and their soul abhorred my statutes. Yet in spite of this, when they are in the land of their enemies, I will not reject them, nor will I abhor them as to destroy them, breaking my covenant with them, for I am the Lord their God. He doesn't cease being their God even when they cease acknowledging him. He doesn't cease being their God even when they walk in coldness and he spanks them. He's still their father, but he's waiting to bless them with the domicile the promise, the uh, domicile just means you live there. They don't get to live there if they don't do what he says. And he says in verse 45, I will remember for them the covenant of their ancestors, whom I brought out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the nations, and I that I might be their God. I am the Lord. And you will see that phrase over and over in the text. These are the statutes and ordinances and laws which the Lord established between himself and the sons of Israel through Moses at Mount Sinai. Let me summarize this by saying this. You're going to hear in many places in Bible studies that Mosaic covenant was conditional. It wasn't conditional as to whether or not the covenant of Abraham would be overruled. It was conditional as to whether or not God would bless them in the land where they had pro he had promised them. And it was going to remain that way and they would lose domicile. However, the title and ownership of the land was there it's even when they weren't in it, because forever means forever. I give you the land to you and your sons forever. Check 23, check 46 of Genesis. You will see it over and over. The point is, you don't get to have it. So, my son, out of blessing, or my daughters, out of blessing, get a car from the old man. I give him a car. And then he's out too late because, you know, him and Larissa, they're just, you know, staying out late and whatever. And so I take the keys. The ownership is still titled to him, but the keys are in my hands. That's how that covenant works. In replacement theology, in the theology of the Reformed Church, in the theology of churches that understand that we are now Israel, this is a conditional covenant that, that wipes out the earlier one. However, I will show you by the time we get to the New Testament that the scripture is clear that no covenant wipes out a previous covenant. God didn't dismiss earlier covenants with later ones. When he says it, it continues to be.